What's up, everybody? My name is Tanner, and welcome to 1980 Now, a podcast for truth seekers and free thinkers. I hope you have all had a fantastic week, and as always, thank you for being here with me today. I've had so much support and positive feedback lately, and I wouldn't be able to do any of this without you guys, the listeners. Of course, I have to say that if you enjoy this podcast, and if it brings value to your life, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. And feel free to follow me on Instagram at 1980nowpodcast to see interesting pictures, clips, and life updates about the show. Another way that you can support me is by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Five-star reviews help the show analytically and with the algorithm so that I get recognized by more potential listeners. Today, I am with a very special guest. Many regard him as the father of the modern-day Flat Earth resurgence, and while he will probably disagree with such claims, there's no denying that his viral video series, Flat Earth Clues, helped to catapult the movement. Guys, my guest today is the one and only Mark Sargent. Mark, how's it going, man? Hey. <laughs> it's going <laughs> fine, and thank you, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. I was thinking about it as I was writing uh, your introduction. Um, a lot of people kind of refer to you as the father of the modern day Flat Earth resurgence, as I said, but I think yeah. you're actually closer to Flat Earth's cool uncle. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, yeah, I, you know, I've heard some of this, you know, I, I've heard <laughs> different variations, president, Lord, King, demigod, uh, all that's no, I, none of that's true. I mean, I, I'm just a guy having to stumble across something and um, made, put, put it out there in the internet and in a simple way and said, okay, look, I think this, tell me yeah. where I'm wrong. And instead of people just, you know, the average trolls, just troll army, just mowing me down, it was a whole bunch of people and different subject matter experts. One I just did last night, another Navy guy, um, uh, missile uh, master chief. And they all said, oh, yeah, it's not that crazy. So, no, yeah. I, am, I am a freshman recruiter, nothing more. The only thing I can, I can lay credit for is that if you get into Flat Earth, there is a high degree of probability you're going to run into my stuff first. Absolutely. Well, Mark, I mean, you're, uh, I think it was called, I know your Flat Earth Clues has been uploaded to YouTube in several mm -hmm. different ways. And I think it was under the dome, maybe. Um, I'm, I've, I'm kind of an OG. I've been into Flat Earth since like late 2015, early 2016. Yeah. And so I think it was under the dome. That was one of the first <laughs> uh, Flat Earth. And that wasn't even mine. That was another person that, so what, what I did was, you know, because I really, really wanted to get answers out there from the internet hive mind. Uh -huh. I made, I go under YouTube and there's a setting you can do for Creative Commons license which says that anyone can take my stuff and use it for anything. And it's still out there today. Every video I try to, and I granted, if I use music, you can't do it. You know, you have to, you know, you won't be able to monetize it. But when I put my early stuff out there, you could absolutely monetize it. And yeah. so I put it out there and people started collecting the clues and putting them under different names on their channel. Just why the heck not? And one of them was called uh, Under the Dome, full documentary, which was weird because... Uh, I don't know if he was trying to get p hits from the television series by Stephen King under the dome, uh, because that's how D. Marvel got into it, or they are hiding God with the greatest lie ever, or they are hiding God with the biggest lie ever. And yes. between those three video um, channels, those three videos, I think it's combined, I don't know, 8 million, something along those lines. It was a lot. Yeah. And it was, I couldn't, um, I, I didn't even know who these guys were. And I didn't even know they were out there until much, much later. And people are saying, oh, hey, I liked your movie. Hey, I liked your two-hour thing. I'm going, <laughs> I've never made a two-hour video. What are you talking about? Right. So finally, I, I, I asked somebody. I, I said, what, I go, what are you clicking on exactly? And they showed me. It's like, oh, my Lord. So, yeah, my stuff was mirrored a lot. And that's how I got all the hits. I mean, my channel still, you know, barely is going to crack 90,000 subs. And yet there are, you know, stuff out there with millions and millions of hits that, uh, you know, it's, it's my work, but it's on somebody else's channel. So somebody made quite a bit of money. <laughs> Definitely. Well, and do you think that your channel has been, and I mean, I'm sure the answer is going to be obviously yes, that you, your channel has been um, censored to a certain degree. 
Uh, we're definitely going to talk about Flat Earth, but I, I want to talk about a couple of things before, and censorship is one of those things that I wanted to not, hit on. Not censored necessarily. I mean, you can ask any, no, none of the big channels have gone down. I mean, yeah, Eric, Eric DeBay's channel's gone down twice, but that's because he, he's into other things. Um, <laughs> yeah. But everybody, like Jaron and Globusters and D Marble and D Weiss, you know, if, as long as you stay on Flat Earth, you got really no problem. However, as you know, there was a congressional hearing or as a Senate hearing, Senate hearing, um, a while back where they said, okay, we're going to recommend flat earth less <laughs> after recommending us pretty much nonstop for three years. They decided at the end of 2018 that they were going to recommend us less. And yeah, yeah. The, the monetization side went down at least 60%, you know, almost immediately because they, they just, we just weren't being recommended on the right hand column. So, but at the same time, they weren't shutting us down either. I mean, they could have they could have gone after us like they did with false flags and and false shootings and stuff like that, but they didn't. So, as much as I'd like to say, oh, you know, oh, poor me, no, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that because YouTube, especially. I mean, I wouldn't even be talking to you right now if it wasn't for YouTube. So, hey, uh, you you take the good with the bad. Right. Well, it, it's one of those things that it, it's hard to say. Um, how they could possibly be censoring all of these different YouTubers because, I mean, some some have been hit really hard. And like you said, um, when you're talking about certain things like calling shootings a hoax oh, yeah, yeah. or you, those kind of things. You, if you make a false flag video tied to a shooting that is any that has happened any time in the last 10 years, uh, they will pull it. They will absolutely pull it. They will call it um, a community guideline issue. They, it's not a copyright strike. It's a community guideline strike, which is much worse. Because right. If you get like just a couple of those, your your channel's crippled, and you're you're not probably coming back from that. Um, but I, you know, the media people forget the media is privately owned; it's a private corporation. You know, no different than, and I'm not I'm not defending them. I'm just saying this sure. is how it works. Like it's, like it's no different than a restaurant: no shirt, no shoes, no service, right? And they can change those rules whenever they want. And so, yeah, it's not fair necessarily, but what's fair in the in the private sector? So. Yeah, well, it, it's just sad that they don't believe in free speech. Um, there's all these channels that have either gone down or they're like, we are in the death throes of this channel. And so we are going to move to BitChute or DLive or these other platforms. But right. the problem with that is that all they're going to be doing, those people, those those creators are just going to be basically speaking into an echo chamber. Whereas the great thing about YouTube is everyone is on it. You know, everyone yeah. is using YouTube, and so it's so easy to be uh, a blue-pilled normie, right? And then right. stumble upon Mark Sargent or stumble upon Rob Skiba or Eric Dubay or any of these people right. where you, it's, it's going to be so much less likely on a website like BitChute or any of these other platforms because, well, you have to be there. It's a tough, it's a tough road because YouTube would like to shut down all sorts of stuff, believe it or not. They'd love to close it all down. However, you know, it, YouTube makes so much money that they don't want, they know full well, it's not hard nowadays to, if you want to, you know, have somebody come in a big player and, and construct a big server farm and call it something else, you can do it and you can merge people over. Look, uh, MySpace used to be a thing. So don't, don't think that it can't be done. So they're riding this, this tight rope. Um, but look at, here's a great little example for you of how things, you know, old boss, same as the, or sorry, new boss, same as the old boss was when Joe Rogan decided to leave YouTube, you know, he took that exclusive contract over at, uh, uh what the hell was that? Sound, sound bite, some, uh, yeah, I can't remember, but whatever, made a, like big, millions of a dollars. big service, right? He goes over there, signs a sit nine figure deal <laughs> to go over there. Yeah. And you know, it's not all at once, you know, but he's got to basically be there for the rest of his life. And they, um, when he got there and he took all his archives with him, they made sure they, they, they pulled all the, uh, the Alex Jones ones. So when they were up there, not, not just Alex Jones, some other people. So it's like, okay, so you went over, you know, you were worried about censorship and being not monetized and that's happening at the, at the new place right away. Yeah, free speech is a tough, free speech is a wonderful idea in theory. But well, did you hear about that that pregnant Australian woman uh, that got arrested yeah, just a couple of days ago for a yeah, Facebook post? Being charged with incitement. <laughs> yeah. Incitement. I didn't even know that was a thing, but in Australia, yeah, it is. Well, but that's but but in 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 the United States, it's called something different. You can't 
tell you can't go on a public forum it's it's fire yelling fire in a crowded theater you can't go on a forum and say hey we should all go downtown and burn one one of the buildings down you you can't do it and there's they and so i don't know exactly which one she called it the the which group she was trying to organize she wasn't completely innocent but it was very very interesting that they went to her house to grab her yeah, well, and the scenario itself is just like – I mean that's the inspiration for this podcast. It's 1980 now as in yeah. 1984 is happening right now. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just so crazy to see these scenarios, these masked figures coming in just you know, coming into these p- people's homes, a pregnant lady and arresting her in front of her family because of something that she put – into the ether it's it's just so incredible it's so amazing I, it, you're absolutely right um one other thing I, I should mention about the censorship thing is that again free speech is is here's where it gets muddy is when you're talking about corporations and corporate lawyers corporate lawyers people don't understand that's the whole reason like the whole virus lockdown thing is happening it's not because the companies are complying it's because the corporate lawyers went to whatever company it is and they said yeah we could be legally vulnerable you know, if something we, we could be legally exposed because what like the NBA, a perfect example, um, if so, because all you have to do is have somebody come in, the lawyer paints this scenario. Somebody goes to the game, you know, the, the arena is full. He comes out, they say, I've got the virus <laughs> and yeah. they can, they, you know, maybe, maybe six months from now, a year from now, and they can come back and do a class action suit or, you know, some sort of settlement. You're going to be paying a lot of money. You know, because it's going to be very difficult to prove. It's going to be a tough, tough lawsuit to just beat down. You know, you won't be able to get it dismissed. You multiply that by just about every company. And corporations like YouTube, you know, the one of the big reasons they had to clean up stuff, I shouldn't say had, they knuckled under was because YouTube was very, very big. And, the, and they were putting corporate, they were putting advertisements just wherever they felt like it. And it didn't matter if it was a conspiracy video or a hate video or whatever. And some of these corporations says, yeah. You can't do that. You can't put our Chevy truck ad on a white supremacy video, or you can't put our Ford ad on some you know, blah, blah, blah. And so YouTube said, hey, we're YouTube. What are you going to do? And so people's corporations started pulling out, you know, sponsorship started pulling out. Well, the old adage is, is still very much true today, and that is money talks. And that's why they do it. So free speech, yeah, wonderful idea. Very difficult to do in the private sector in a pure fashion, which we'd all love to have. Uh, it just it's tough to do. Look at um, look at all the BitTorrent. You remember the BitTorrent stuff, uh huh? Right, you know, sharing movies and videos. You know, and get out there. And the corporations, it took them a, it took them years to do it, but they finally, you know, cracked down on the servers, one by one by one. So anyway, well, go ahead. I, I mean, I should clarify. I I totally agree i believe in the private sector and i think that you know private companies should have every right to um you know handle their business as they want to um you know as long as it's in a i guess legal and respectable manner but it it only takes you know there's so many things Uh, it only takes a few bad apple to spoil the bunch you know which is like free speech protests peaceful protests as you know this is very recent (laughs) peaceful protests great and then all of a sudden the sun goes down (laughs) And all it takes is a handful of people to just screw it up for everybody to where now when you go to the peaceful, you know, when you look at the peaceful protests, you're looking at them in a completely different light. And that is most of those people there just want to stand around and chant ridiculous things. But you're thinking, I'm just like, is any one of these people, could they like start throwing rocks? Could they start, you know, burning places down? Are they gonna, who knows what they're going to do? So you're suspicious of anybody um, once burned, you know, once bitten, twice shot. You know, while we're on the subject of YouTube, I, I don't know. It's just sad to see uh, those days be gone. Those days of just being able to to get on YouTube and find all these amazing channels. But yeah. uh, to transition into the uh, the protesting and stuff, it was interesting. I was listening to one of your videos this morning, yeah. and I think it uh, might have been a recent one, but I'm not sure. But what? you were talking about you. You said the same line. You said when the sun goes down, it's like everything changes and it just sounded so systematic and formulaic and whenever you research agitation propaganda and how uh you know agents of change work it it just makes you wonder if when the sun goes down is that a signal to these people these these agents that they can start um you know throwing the first bricks and looting and rioting the first i know that a lot of it is organic but it just makes you wonder because of how systematic it sounds 
I don't think so. I, I don't think it's just, no, it's, it's one of those things that's built into us. All the bad stuff usually happens at night. Um, under the cover, and you've heard this, you've heard the saying, under the cover of darkness. You sure. know, all your, all your big military missions, you know. The, well, and, and nothing good ever happens after midnight. <laughs> no, yeah. no, nothing ever good happens after midnight. Uh, and that's the same thing with protesters. You know, you, you're, you're less visible. You think you can sneak around and, and do the bad stuff. And it's true for the most part. You can't be seen as easily unless, you know, you're being tracked with night vision or, you know, these idiots don't realize. It's like, look, every one of you is carrying a cell phone. You think they're not tracking exactly where you are? Now, they're not going to come get you right then, but they know where you are. You know, they know if you're in the vicinity, they know what you're, what you're doing on a regular basis. And they, they compl they're completely oblivious to it. It's like, look, at the highest levels, they know exactly who's at the protest. And yeah. that will come back to haunt them eventually. I'm not saying this from an agency capacity. I'm just saying that's what I would do. Sure. So, yeah, but yeah, at night, all bets are off. Uh, Katrina, for example, when um, they looted during the day, but at night, that's when the guns came out. I mean, even the cops wouldn't go into New Orleans uh, at night, you know, after the Katrina thing. Right. It was just black. I mean, it wasn't like this where there was that, you know, I can't remember the difference between this and a Katrina scenario. This is a big, big, big difference. And that is protesters right now, the power is still on. Everything's yeah. working. If the lights were off, you, people don't have understand how dark the world is when you remove electricity. And people would just be just blasting each other. It would be a free for all. It would be a, oh, it'd be a nightmare. Anyway. Oh yeah, it's that it's that dystopian Orwellian future that it seems like we're being pushed into. Um, the whole the whole protesting and rioting and Black Lives Matter thing is a subject that I've actually been very um, nervous about approaching on this podcast. This is actually just my ninth episode, and so. Um, it's, it's such a, for lack of a better term, it's so black and white, it seems like, uh, in our culture right now. But you always seem to approach this topic with such a gentle and level-headed perspective. And so um, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about it on my podcast. And um, there, there's just, there's so much to it. And, and it, I, like I said, I'm nervous about, about going into it. But Well, again, it's, it's, it, there's, no, there's no easy answers for a lot of this stuff. You know, it, I, it's how, how I kind of got into conspiracies in the first place. I'm one of those, I'm one of the rare conspiracy people that actually looks at the greater good, which is, all right, you know, yes, there's sinister conspiracies out there. We all know there's conspiracies in politics and business and sports and entertainment and even journalism and science. We, there's the ones we want to look at, they're on this side of the line, and there are these the uncomfortable ones on the other side. The question is, why when you're looking at the other ones why do you why do most people look at them as super sinister and evil and awful you know made <laughs> by smoking men in in giant long tables that apparently have no lighting in the room um what why are you know what's happening there and for the most part from what i can tell which is my qualifier for any good conspiracy is does you know is there a great is there a goal in mind that they're doing where they're trying to justify the means you know, the, the, does the end, does the horrible means justify the end, you know, that they're, they're trying to get to. Right. And uh, sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't really depends on, on its perspective. You know, can you put a, a, a price on human life? Yeah. Yeah, you can all day long and not just in life insurance. I mean, we do it in the military. We do it in um, corporations. We, we, we do it all the time. A great example. You, I don't know if you ever heard me do it was the Panama Canal great example of of a, of a conspiracy that nobody ever talked about i get the exclusive rights on that one where <laughs> the panama canal you know how many people died in the in the creation of the panama canal i don't better part of six thousand wow six thousand not military full-blown civilians just walk, walked them down there and they died and they died of malaria and yellow fever and you go well that's acceptable it's like no 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 no, and you and I go. There's a conspiracy there, and you might come back and say, "Well, you, we didn't know they were all going to die." It's like, "Oh yeah, we did. We absolutely we knew, knew they were going to die. In fact, we were willing to lose even more than that because we wanted that Panama Canal to be finished." The United States didn't even start the Panama Canal. It was the French. The French were were there at the end of the 1800s, 1890s, and they lost so many people because they had no idea what they were doing. They were just getting eaten alive that they lost 21,000 men. And to such a degree, they had just abandoned it. You know, the Paris started protesting. There was a lot of people. That's a lot of people. There are wars that don't lose that many. Right. And we came in. It's like, okay, 
how many people are we willing to lose here? You know, we'll develop mosquito netting. We'll develop be better insect repellents. We still lost 6,000. And the question is, okay, where's the conspiracy come in? Here's the conspiracy. When people are signing up for this gig, you know, this engineering gig down in Panama, do you tell them that there's a one in eight chance that you're going to die? <laughs> and not just sort of die. I mean, you know, most people didn't recover from this stuff. And do you tell them? No, you don't. Because you, you want to get the people down there. So, but, with, you know, Panama Canal became a, a fan, you know, the best strategic military choke point and the most expensive toll road in the world. So did the ends justify the means? Depends on who you talk to. Yeah. Fan the people that died? No. Uh, corporations involved in the United States government? Probably. That's so fascinating. And I mean, what it all comes down to when we're talking about conspiracies it always comes down to misinformation, disinformation, the waters are muddied. And something that I've talked about um, before on this podcast is, and I probably sound like a broken record again to my audience, but um, the truth community was kind of wrong this time in regards to COVID-19 because so many of us were looking at SARS and West Nile and Zika and swine flu. And I personally, myself, I told my friends and family, I said, guys, we've seen this happen before. It's all going to blow over, but here we are now, like what seven months into it, and it's still oh no no they're here going and it's for, more real than ever. For, yeah, they're no they're going for broke, but it's it's not, and I I don't know exactly what you're what you're taking us on it. I mean, you're younger, but it's not what people think it is. Yes, you're right. We went through SARS and and West Nile and Ebola and all that stuff, and nobody closed down anything. That's Why what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And the, div the and that's just it. You know, I'm, I'm a big stats guy. And so when you come, I, I, I saw it, I knew exactly what was happening when they did it. When they came in, they said the death rate was going to be 1%. 1% of everybody. That's one in a hundred people. And that's, that is literally the Spanish flu. And in fact, you don't hear about the Spanish flu anymore. You did in the beginning though. And that's a ton of people. You got to remember that in the United States alone, that would be three and a half million people dead. And that didn't happen. Not even close. In fact, it was, you know, that wasn't 2 million, 1 million, half a million. We're, we're what, 160, 170, 180, something like yeah. that? Yeah. It's, it's September. I'm sorry. There isn't a computer model in the world or any model get, going back all the way to the 70s. We all know this, which is once it gets on an airplane, we've, we've seen this in just about every movie you can think of because the airplanes are just an incubator. The filters in airplanes do absolutely nothing, which is why they banned smoking on airplanes, which is once it gets on an airplane, especially an international flight that it's a pressurized cabin, recirculated air, you know, everybody gets something, you know, everybody gets it. And then that plane lands, those people get off and go on other planes and just keeps replicating and replicating and replicating and pretty, and pretty much the whole world gets it in a month. Every, every disaster thing we've ever done, every book written on the sub subject, the whole world pretty much infected with whatever's out there in a month. But we're, eight months in and now it's like they're trying to treat it like it's a slow motion thing it's like oh there could be more infected soon and oh this the hot spot here and more cases there i was like oh, it's like i've done rants on this which are whoa. i mean i it just but everyone's going for it because everybody believes what mainstream tells you it's a line from the truman show which is we believe the world that is presented to us the, the the news absolutely will not lie to you, right? And and which is why, and I I've got to say this, which is like there's you people say, well, there's no such thing as fake news. I go, really? All right, resolve this statement. Are you ready? Everything on Fox News is absolutely true, and everything on CNN is absolutely true. <laughs> you yeah. can't, you can't resolve those two. So it, because you know we're we're so polarized, Democrat or Republican. So it's like, okay, well, somebody's lying. It's like, really? Who? And then once you admit that, it's like, so what I'm saying is, is that what's happening now, this is the tip of the iceberg. We are going into, by the time we get to November, and I'm not trying to turn this to a doom and gloom thing. By the time we get to November, that's my next rant that's coming up on Tuesday. We are, this, this thing is going to just touch off on, on the week of November. It doesn't matter who wins. It's going to go nuts. Here's why, real fast. If Trump wins, well, you know full well what happens if Trump wins. If Trump wins, every Democratic city burns immediately. I mean, everything from San Francisco to Seattle to Portland to Los Angeles to New York to Chicago, they're all going to burn because they're so, everyone hates him so much on the left. It hates him so, so much. 
But if Biden wins, the stock market is going to crash because the stock market is an absolute illusion. People, you know, they, we're, we're almost back up to 30,000 again. With, with what? An unemployment rate, which is staggeringly high. They won't even tell anybody what the unemployment rate actually is. The, the, the NASDAQ, which is all American companies, is as record highs. That's all being done for the election and nothing else. The government is just pumping money into the markets to try to, to prop up the stock market so that it can look good for, you know, so Trump can say, oh, look at that. The market's great. And the left's going, you know, what are they going to do? Say the market's a lie. They'll look like conspiracy people. Anyway, sorry, I go off on rants. No, 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 no. I love it. And that's why you ha I had you on. But I mean, uh, there, there's a lot to unpack there. But what, what I wanted to say was that a lot of this, um, this political, because that's what the coronavirus is. I mean, it is has become so political. But it's like you said, so much of it comes down to what is being said on the media. And so whenever you look at millennials, millennials yeah. lean left and the media leans left. So the millennials consider it virtuous and i'm a millennial myself but i'm just saying i'm just being honest millennials consider it virtuous to believe the media because the media leans left well boomers which is the other half of this cult this political and cultural divide yeah they lean right however they grew up in a time you know walter cronkite and they grew up in a time where the the news the nightly news is gospel truth oh yeah and so uh on both sides you have this uh, almost a addiction to the media and whatever the media puts out whatever whatever kind of lies they spit it doesn't matter because yeah. they're going to believe it but another thing that i wanted to mention um again there was just so much to unpack there that was that was awesome sorry <laughs> no and that's totally it's totally cool that's like again that's my, why my I had brain you doesn't really shut off very much uh, anymore, <laughs> i so. hear you i hear you well i i like that you mentioned that three million figure that was projected because three yeah. million is the amount of americans that die every year from obesity related causes there so you go you have to ask oh, yeah, yourself yeah, yeah. where's yeah, I, the shutdown where yeah, you know the, what i'm saying well yeah we, you're absolutely right uh heart disease lung cancer uh, suicides automobiles we have uh, smoking <laughs> i mean come on we there's so many things that, that kill people more than this but the, because the news said be afraid be and cnn was they took point on this cnn is like be afraid be afraid get worse be afraid you know, there, there's, there's hot spots here, you know, we're going to open. No, we're going to close. This is safe. No, it's not safe anymore. We, absolutely do not wear masks for five months or five weeks. Then you know what? You absolutely should be wearing a mask. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. The, the, the misdirection and the, 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 the confusion is absolutely brilliant. Um, and yeah, it, it's the, the numbers don't add up, but people want to go along with, and then there's a whole nother le level of people that once you reach a certain saturation point, the peer pressure kicked in. So, I mean, I saw this at the grocery stores. At one point, the grocery stores were maybe 30% masks. Nobody really cared. Then 50%. But once it hit about 70% masks, and this was before it was required, it became 90% because yeah. people didn't want to stick out. It's really interesting. People, people want to be individuals, but there's a lot of people that just want to be part of the herd. I mean, legitimately, it's like, you know what? I'd rather just fit in. You know, we've seen this many, many times. It's like, it's easy. I just don't want to be hassled. I don't want to walk down an aisle and be the only one not wearing a mask. Part of them speaks, well, maybe they know something I don't. Other people are like, you know what? I just don't want to get, have any grief over it. Yeah. Well, co conformity is just so much easier. It's the easy it way. I, on my Instagram today, I posted a video of, and, you know, listeners, you can look this up on YouTube. It's called the uh, conformity waiting room experiment and you can look it up on YouTube and basically this lady walks into um, a clinic for a free eye exam yeah. and she sits down and there's all these other people sitting in their chairs and they're all in on it except for her and there's this bell that it, it oh beams. yeah no I, I, I know exactly what you're yeah talking. and they sit and they stand up and so she stands up and just absolutely conforms and so yeah. I was likening that to the mask thing nobody really uh, the majority of people don't believe in it or don't even really know why they're doing it. They're just doing it because everyone else is, and it's so much easier. I would say 99%. I, when I go to the, the supermarket, when I go to the grocery store, when I go anywhere, Mark, I'm yeah. the only person not wearing a mask. And I live in a conservative, right wing, uh, religious Texas town. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'm yeah. the only well, person not wearing a mask. Yeah. It is the people they 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 absolutely want to fit in you know it's it's for the majority of people out there like just getting through high school that's their goal is to be part of the crowd 
you right? You know, they want to be part of the scene. And in this case, it's, it's working against them, but it's been extremely, extremely effective. Now, granted, there are a lot of people out there that don't want to wear the mask and they only wear, you know, they only wear them when they're around other people. And it's like, they take them off immediately. I will only wear them if I absolutely have to. But then I got caught like at the gas station recently. I couldn't tell by what the signs on the door, if I was supposed to wear it or I wasn't, but there was a whole bunch of people there and they were already looking at me coming in because I wasn't wearing one. And it's like, you know what? I, I did. I was like, it's, you'll, you'll understand why in a second. I was part of me. was like, look, I just want to get my gas and get out. I don't want to go into the long diatribe of why mostly because I'm looking down the road. I, why I tell people, I go, look, if you don't, if you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask, but I wouldn't bet the farm on it right now because that's not going to make any damn difference. What's really going to make difference is the vaccine. The mask thing is just to see if you comply. You know, that's sure. just a, a way of testing people. They can look through social media and see who's wearing the mask and who's not, and they can kind of gauge what's going on. I love no, what Jaron said. He said mask equals he might have not been the one who coined it, but he he said mask equals vax, which is like you said, the mask oh, yeah. is about who's going to comply to the vaccine. And who's that's one of the reasons the that I'm I'm so vehemently against wearing the mask is because somebody's got to start the domino effect of saying no. I mean, and people are. Don't get me. I mean, of course, I'm not the only one. But. There are, but you're not, you're not going to beat them. There, there's too many people. There's too many people that are, you've got groups, there's multiple groups. You're not going to beat the mask people. Here's why. And not that it matters because in a few months, none of that's going to matter. Um, because the, there's people that were initially scared. Remember they told, they said anyone over the senior citizen over the six, age of 65 should never leave the house. That was, li- that was their opening salvo, which was, you know, there's a 3% death rate for senior citizens, which was absolutely not the case. Uh, because, you know, and, and then only later this, like, they came out, it's like, oh yeah, by the way, the average age of the person dying is 80 and they all had, you know, underlying conditions which was, you know, they all had high heart disease or uh, diabetes or hypertension or lung cancer or all of the above. And Are, well, you, are you talking you do- about the current CDC numbers that they just quietly yep, updated? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. But it doesn't matter now. <laughs> so the CDC comes out and tells the truth and says, oh yeah, by the way, only 6,000 of the people, and even that's probably a lie, you know, you have only 6,000 people of the people that the 100 something thousand, you know, died of COVID, which is nothing. More people fall off of ladders and die <laughs> than that. But 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 this matter it doesn't matter because it's already saturated. Everybody's freaking wearing them, and public figures are wearing them. But the vax the, the vaccination that's the big one because when it comes along and, I, and people don't understand the reason why this it's like we've had vaccinations like no 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 this one's different because this one you have to prove it because for all this bluster all this planning that goes along you can't just say hey you got to get the vaccine because People will just lie. They're, just, they're, just, they're gonna say, "Oh yeah, I got it. Totally got it. Look, there's a little mark in my arm." No, no, no. no. You, you've got to tie some sort of authentication system with it, and that's where everything just goes sideways. Because as you know, the biomechanical kind of uh, oh yeah, mark yeah, of the beast uh, kind of system that gonna, we've been talking insert, about for years. Yeah, you're gonna insert. Yeah, what we've been every every main conspiracy world has been waiting for this for a long, 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 long time. And now that it's finally happening, now people are, you know, they, they almost can't believe it. It's like, oh, absolutely. I mean, no one, that's why everything is so convoluted in the truth community because nobody really knows, like you said, what to do with it. And I, I always think of that uh, quote that the Joker says, where he says, you know, I, he, I can't remember what he's talking about, but he's talking about how I would be like a dog who caught a car and a dog who caught a car. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, wouldn't know, what know what to do with it. it. Well, that's it. how everything it, in the truth community, we've been talking about all of this stuff in the either in the future tense or the past tense for so long uh, that now it's it, it is happening right before our eyes. It just feels like a dream. Yeah. That, the, by the way, from that same monologue, uh, you know, one of the greatest, probably the greatest superhero movie of all time. Um, with Heath Ledger, you know, just crushed it, crushed that role. But there was oh, a yeah. great, the writing was perfect where he said he was talking, you know, he was trying to explain, basically t- trying to tell Batman, he's like, look, why are you trying to save these people? Right. He goes, he goes, their code <laughs> is dropped at the first sign of trouble. He goes, he goes, you wait. He goes, when the chips are down, these civilized people will eat each eat other each other yeah, yeah. and it, it yeah. couldn't have been more right in fact that but they didn't follow through on it they put they they blinked when you know they the ferries with you know the bombs on the the two boats uh-huh. and they were supposed to blow each other up and neither side did it no 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 absolutely one of those groups would have done it 
and it was a perfect example. You had all the prisoners on one boat and all the normal civil, you know, commuter civilians on the other, and they could blow up each other's boat, which, you know, you don't know if it was rigged or not. But uh, it's like, no, and, and, you know, Batman's like, see, there's hope, there's in the world. It's like, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's there's this uh, Christian metal band called Impending Doom, and they have a song that's called Anything Goes. And the basic theory of the song is when everything is gone, anything goes. And that's what I've been trying to kind of tell my friends and family lately is that, look, when, you know, like like the Joker said, when the chips are down and people are hungry or they have kids that they need to feed yep. or their kid needs some kind of uh, medication or yep. e- whatever it is people will kill people yeah, will I, murder and steal and rape and all of the above absolutely i wrote that in a survival manual which is on amazon right now because my publisher said yeah it might be a nice time to put that out there um never published it until this year uh called empty shelves and i wrote it after katrina and i use yeah that exact, almost that exact verbiage i said look you don't have you don't realize that when people when push comes to shove we've seen this in different countries and even in the united states people especially if they have families, especially, I mean, don't, don't think for a second what, you know, what, what a mother won't do for her kids. They will lie, cheat, steal, and kill because it's, it's all about survival. And especially if they don't know you, you know, especially nowadays, it's, you know, the neighborhood communities aren't nearly as, as integrated. You know, not, not that that was bulletproof either. There was a wonderful, you want to watch a wonderful, did you ever watch the old Twilight Zone episodes from the 50s? Yeah, yeah, I grew up on that. that perfect. Stuff. Yeah, perfect. There was a one of the one of the greatest episodes ever was called um, "The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street." Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, Love it. You know, Rod Serling when he wrote that, I don't know if he was he was thinking about the communist threat or whatever it was, but the whole point was that this, is that aliens you didn't know who they were flew over a neighborhood and cut the power, and then slowly but surely they started leaving crumbs. So all of a sudden, somebody's house would lights would come on, or a car would start. And people would be suspicious of these people. It's like, oh, you, they must be in on it. They must be part of the problem. They're part of the invasion force or whatever. And you just keep making it faster and faster and faster. And then all of a sudden, blood is spilled. And before you know it, people are just running through the streets, attacking each other because they're, they're absolutely sure that everybody's a threat. And that wasn't even a survival scenario. That was just paranoia. And you, you, know, you throw in hunger and uh, fatigue and all this other fun stuff. I, I, it's it's not going it's not fun at, at all well ultimately mark it comes down to the fact that we have created a system that we are fully dependent on and yes. um i well, hate well, that hey, I, no, i'll give you one one more line you ever watch the um i've got so many movie references um <laughs> you ever watch the tom cruise movie oblivion uh i don't think so it Where sounds he was familiar a clone though. that was oh if you haven't seen it you really should Where okay. it's, it's set some some years in the future where he well we won't get into the clone aspect but the world that the apocalypse has already happened and it was caused by some alien group and the aliens didn't even have to really land <laughs> he goes morgan freeman was just you know he's the old grizzled guy and he was describing he's going all they had to do was, was create earthquakes and cut the um the food distribution lines he goes he goes he goes most of the people just starved <laughs> because you, they couldn't get to the grocery store there was no grocery stores to get to you know, the once they were empty, people don't understand the grocery stores do not have our our distribution system, our system like you put out there, is very fragile. Very, very, very fragile. I mean, it's efficient in 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 some ways, but if you hit it hard enough, the whole thing collapses. People um people don't don't know what to do. Well, and that's one of the reasons that I've tried to in a non preachy way, because I mean, look, I'm still learning. Okay. I yeah. just started all of this um at the beginning of uh, you know, COVID-19. Um, but I've yeah. tried to, in a non-preachy way, communicate to my audience that you should probably try and start learning how to grow food. And I've done that myself and I'm nowhere near self-sufficient, but I have learned how to grow watermelons and squash and black eyed peas and all these different nice. things. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and it's been a skill that I've had to learn and it has taken a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of energy. I'm, and I'm, and again, I have the luxury of being able to work from home because my wife and I, our job is working from home is working remotely now sure. because of COVID-19. Um, but I think that people need to really think about that. Think about learning skills, learning different kinds of skills, whether it be, uh, even having a skill that could be valuable, like welding or uh, carpentry or anything that could be valuable in 
as much as I hate to say it, a post-apocalyptic world or a world where the system is down because that's what's – you can't eat money. I mean it's been said so many times before. It doesn't matter how much cash that you have saved up. Oh, you can't no, eat and, it. And to that point, you also can't eat gold or silver. <laughs> People, I've got friends. You know, they swear. It's like, oh, I've got so much gold and so much silver stocked up. And it's like – I go, yeah, that's the after stage. I go, you, you're forgetting about the, the stage in between, which, which I like to call the bullet stage. <laughs> yeah. You got to get through that part first. Well, and that's you know? why the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds decided to start backing things up with you know, oil and water because they yeah. realized that. They realized that resources are going to that have a functional mechanical ability have way more value than e gold or silver. Yeah. Even they, though, aren't, aren't um, completely – immune from everything there oh was, sure there was, sure there was there was an article i read just today um it was a i don't it might be true where there was some think tanks you know somebody was basically writing about he, he was in a um some think tanks with some billionaires and the billionaires were very very curious and one of their questions was how do they keep their security teams loyal in a in a in an end time scenario and we've seen this in different movies, right? Which is, you know, it's like, yeah, you can have an army, you know, a private army of 50, 100 guys or whatever, you know, armed to the teeth, very, very well trained. The problem is, is you, how do you keep them motivated? You know, because after a while, they're going to realize it's like, hey, you know what? <laughs> we, you know, they could stage a coup. I mean, that's classic coup. That's why so many militaries, they're the ones that take over whatever government and whatever country in the faraway land. Yeah, and so you know, if you're a billionaire, how do you how do you keep your guys from eventually? Oh yeah, you can keep them loyal for a while, but eventually it's one of those things like, I, I, do we need you? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, you made a billion dollars, you paid for the place, grateful for that. But uh, you know, everybody else you know can can do better than you right now. So yeah, it's kind <laughs> well, of and, you know, I, and I don't believe that even the the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers are the true elite. I think they're probably second in command because we know their names. Right. Um, oh, I think that the ones that the true elite, we don't know their names. You know. Yeah, I'm preaching to the choir on that one. The, the, <laughs> old, the one, the first rule of power, literally the first rule of power is stay hidden, and that yeah. is if you want to stay, you it is the curse and the blessing of of being a puppet master. You can't be the pus puppet master and be on stage at the same time. Because if they know who you are, you can be overthrown. They can find you. They can't find you if they don't know who you are. And that's the, the, the beauty of anonymity, which is, you know, it, it, people say, oh, it's the Illuminati, it's the Rothschilds, it's the Bilderbergs, the, the Council of Foreign Relations, and blah, 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 trilateral, Masons, Vatican, just go on and on. Who's the top dog and who's, you know, what pecking order? It's like, doesn't matter because you know those names. Um, you know, like the, the only one that even remotely is intriguing to me is like Majestic 12 because, yeah, you know the number kind of, but you don't know who they are. You don't know, you don't know where they meet or anything like as far as I know, but whatever. Uh, I just want to clarify for my audience really fast is that we are not trying to instill fear or doom and gloom into anybody. We just believe that getting all of this out in the open and talking about it gives people the opportunity to – discover for themselves solutions and you know that's all we're trying to oh, do yeah. here so i just yeah, want to make yeah. that clear for my audience knowledge is is a powerful powerful thing and the powers that be are notorious for only educating people the masses remember conformity builds empires uh this is very very true but you can't you want people intelligent but only enough intelligence to get things done Right, drive a car, go to work, build some things. You want things very specialized, which is why you know things are left out. When we go through high school, for example, not not necessarily university, because you can study whatever you want at university, but a lot of people don't go to university. When you go through high school, you are not taught a lot about physics or engineering or chemistry or microbiology or any there's so many other things that 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 fall into, you know, that apply to the bigger picture. Microbiology, perfect example of what's happening now with the, uh, with the virus, which is like people don't understand microbiology. They don't know how, what should be happening. And so they are just told by people in lab coats what it is. It's like, it's this, it's this, it's this. And people are like, okay, he's, he's wearing a lab coat. He's got to be. And when other doctors, again, it's got to be media sanctioned. So when those doctors came out recently, that group of doctors that were in the field, the ones that are actually in the hospitals, and they're trying to say, look, Whatever you think is happening, it is not. And they're immediately discredited by, by mainstream media. It's like, oh, they're completely debunked. They're this and that. And, and in fact, the, you know, they held a press conference right on Capitol Hill 
none of the major media things even showed up for it. Even yeah. though they have tons and tons and tons of social media presence, the mainstream media has a narrative that they will not back off of right now. They well, are, just because of morbid curiosity, Mark, uh, death and fear and, and sickness sells way better. It's, it's, it creates better it headlines. It, the, yeah, I, Good I news said, doesn't. <laughs> I said this in a rant. Um, I don't know if I put it in the book which is, you know, I, during these five years that I've been doing this, this whole flat earth thing, I've talked to a lot of field producers. I've talked to a lot of producers and they have all told me the same thing. They said, publicly, we don't want anyone to die. Privately, we want the plane to crash every time. <laughs> sure. And that's true because it, you, you've heard it. If it bleeds, it leads. People, I mean, it's the reason why since the beginning of the highways to even today, decades and decades later, if there's an accident on the side of road, uh, the side of the road, people slow down to look because they want us. They they want to look. It's like, oh wow, that's really grisly. Wow, better him than me, <laughs> you know, type thing. They want to see the carnage. You know, they want to see the horror, but they um, but but they they it makes them feel better about themselves in a in a small way. And sure. um, the news feeds on that. I mean, but this is this is tailor made. Twenty twenty is tailor made for mainstream media. Uh, CNN literally every single day, twenty stories on how much they hate Trump, and twenty stories about how the virus may or may not kill you. And, well, and, been, and you have to wonder a little bit because it it almost seems like whenever you look at it from the perspective that the world is a stage and that the media is completely controlled. Yeah. It's like the virus thing happened, right? And then a few months in, suddenly uh, we have these crazy uh, protests. And it's almost like they just – when people start getting bored of the coronavirus thing, they just throw something else into the mix that they know yeah, is yeah, super yeah. divisive. The, the, yeah, you're absolutely right. The protest was a fantastic misdirection, and it also served a second purpose, which was if you want to protest against the virus, the whole mask thing, good luck doing that in the States because nobody wants to. It's like, oh, crap we may run into the BLM protesters while we're out there. You don't want to, you want to go protest when you might, you know, and, and we've seen what happens when, you know, some of the Republican contingencies go out there against the, the BLM. I mean, it's a, it's a nightmare, which again, yeah. which is why they're setting this thing all. I mean, you wait, but the week of that election, it is going to be bedlam. Utter for, and I'm not, again, I'm not preaching fear here. I'm telling you what's going to happen. I'm <laughs> not looking not, forward is, to it, Mark. Yeah, the, the what? I said I'm not looking forward to it. That's for no, sure. no, I'm not either. I, but at the same time, I'm on an island, you know, north of Seattle. I can see Seattle from here, but yeah, you don't you don't want to be there. And and like for example, um, the the rants I'm going to be doing, the uh, weeks before this election even happens, the uh, the White House will put up the steel wall. A lot of people don't know they've got a steel barrier system that's that they've used already, and they're going to put that up there, and there will be thousands and thousands of people circling in in Washington, just waiting for the results. And it doesn't matter, again, who, whoever they decide, they, they will, because it, think of it this way. If Biden wins, for example, I, I, I really couldn't pick who was going to win this one because it's, it's bad either way. If Biden wins, what happens is you have this energizing force that, that goes out because a lot of the people that are saying, oh, defund the police and all that, now that they think that the Democrats control the White House and have absolute power, which they don't, they think that's going to happen. So now they're going to protest even more. It's like, yeah, yeah, let's start, de you know, you guys don't even have jobs anymore, so you might as well quit type thing. And some of the police will actually buy into that, even though their commanders and chiefs will say, oh, no, 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 you're fine. They'd be like, really? Because the Democrats now in the White House. How are, is that a guarantee? Do we, or do we know for sure? Oh, oh, it's going to, I'm going to sit down with a huge bowl of popcorn and just, just start flipping through Driven through channels, trying to see, you know, trying to, I don't even know. In fact, if I was mainstream media, I don't even know where I'd send them. You know, do you send them all to Z DC? Do you send some, you know, where, where do you, do you deploy your teams? Because it is, and again, that's, that's the Biden side, right? If the Trump yeah, that's side. That's just one side. <laughs> yeah. That's that. If the, if the Trump side, it's, uh, it's, it's staggering. And it, people just don't understand how, which is why, um, there's a, I'm, I read a letter for my rant this year that was posted by a woman on Facebook uh, here, up here in the Northwest, not, not too far from here. And she posted this rant about how much she hates him, okay? And, you know, Trump, without even saying his name. And that's just one person. Multiply that by, I don't know, half the country? Yeah. 
it's right. not gonna, it's not gonna be fun. Anyway, well, you know, no, it's it's amazing. I mean, I I don't believe in politics. I don't believe in the political system. But it's so amazing that that half more than half the country it seems like has let themselves become victims of this stuff. Like they have let these politicians, particularly Trump, have yeah. so much power over their emotions. Exactly, I mean, just the, crying tears over over his win. I mean, it's you're so absolutely incredible. right, and that's why they put him in there. That part was, and I questioned it at first, but now I get it. Which was, again, remember, he was nothing. People say, "Oh, he was a great billionaire." It's like, no, no, no. He was a fading, fading business exec that they just happened to grab. You know, the, some producers. You know, they just lucked out with the whole um, appre apprentice thing. And the, you know they talk behind the scenes that they they say oh yeah he was he was just a lonely guy in an office a beaten down office not doing anything, and we turned him into this reality television star. But what people understand was he was the symbol for, for lack of a better word, um, old America, you know the boomers, right? He was the he was that he was the perfect, the boomer example of what America you know the glory days. Well, and he and, was you know, proof that if you, with a little bit of hard work, and if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that you can become something. Or, uh, or inherit to them. Yeah, or inherit your father's name and money. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course. Well, we know I mean, that. But. I, look, I don't vote, but come on. I mean, I watched this guy, and it's it's comedian time. I mean, he, if his name, and I'm not trying to be mean here. Look, for all the all you Trump supporters out there, I was like, look, you you've got to face a fact. Uh, if you listen to him talk a lot. Um, if his last name wasn't Trump, he'd be a used car salesman on the bad side of, of town, <laughs> period. Right. He'd be selling cars because like, it's, it's tremendous. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. Very, very good. Good. He only has 10 adjectives, you know, and he just rolls them out. I mean, if you did a drinking game based on his adjectives, you'd die of alcohol poisoning. I mean, he's, he's just, and he's the better of the two, right? When's the, by the way, when's the first time you've ever seen a political race where it's so emotionally charged and both candidates are oh my god i don't even know how to describe them i mean you know biden why they they literally picked the the worst can people don't understand that biden he wasn't even in this thing it was elizabeth yeah. warren and they were like oh no her views are, are too bad well let's go with um well, she's too weak uh, well, well, to, to go get someone like trump there's just well, no way that's just it right because they're they're like they're going well she's not gonna work then it's like well we're gonna go with bloomberg but nobody knew him outside of new york city uh, or the East Coast. Uh, okay, well, we'll go with Bernie Sanders. Well, that's probably not a good idea either. So <laughs> Too old. He's go, old hat, 100%. Yeah, they had to go all the way back. It's like, well, who we got? The only person that had any numbers at all, they had to go back to Biden. And they were like, well, yeah, but he's kind of, you know, th at this point, uh, not, not to go off on a, a separate thing, it's like, you know, there's three debates scheduled. The first one is in two weeks nobody thinks that there's going to be three debates. In fact, most people don't even think that there'll be one. So does he do a debate? Do you actually roll out Biden in front of, of Trump? But to your point, it is the most emotionally charged. Yeah. Why did everybody fall into it? It's because the media did it. You know, the media created the, 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 the linchpin was Trump because they created a candidate, a media guy that was so polarizing. You, you, there's nobody was on the fence about this guy. Nobody. So to where you either loved him or you hated him. And yeah. when have we seen this? With, with ever, 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 well, ever, well, ever. People underestimate the role that social media has in this because if you think about it, an election happens every four years, okay? So we've only had social media that has the the power that it has for i mean how many elections ha have we had this kind of social in the 90s oh, no, very yeah we might have had the, the internet and certain platforms and stuff but it didn't have the power over people that it has today and so i think social media has so much to do with all oh, no, of the you're right I mean, convolution two, I yeah mean, think about 2008 with um obama you know he was in eight years and uh, he you know he, he was gonna get reelected. It's like, well, the first four weren't terrible, so let's bring him in for another four. What do we got to lose? And so, yeah, by the time they got to this election, you know, the, the 2016 one with, with Trump, you know, I still have fun with the, yeah, people underestimate social media. Well, they underestimate the plans within plans of, of the powers that be. Because if you watch the first, I, I recommend, this, recommend this to anybody, watch the first seven minutes, you don't have to watch any more after that, of the Michael Moore movie uh, uh, Fahrenheit 11.9 not to be confused with 9-11, where he's bas it's basically the, a brilliant montage of how no one thought he was going to win. 
nobody backed him. I mean, he absolutely had no chance in hell. Hillary supposedly had an 80-something percent chance of winning. He didn't even write an acceptance speech. It's like he was doomed. Even, even the Republic, no Republicans would even back him. And yeah. he wins. And, well, that's and, because presidents are selected, not elected. There and you go. Trump doesn't have to be in on any of it and any of the plans of the elites none of it he doesn't have to be in on it he's the right. perfect puppet he's the perfect mouthpiece to yeah. push whatever agenda that they want and so whoever yeah. wins this next election is just going to be whoever the better candidate is to push their agenda like biden came out recently and said he wants to make and this could be fake news i don't know but he said that from what i heard he said that he wants to make mask wearing a law because right, right. now these uh, mandates are not laws. You know, government right. governors cannot make laws. They can't create and laws. He wouldn't. He wouldn't be able to do that anyway, um, because of the whole state jurisdiction thing. You know, sure, he, but it, what I'm getting at is that it just yeah. comes down to who is going to be a louder voice for the agenda that the elite wants to push. Is it going to be yeah. Donald Trump, who came out and said wearing a mask is patriotic? And I know that it doesn't all come down to just the mask. That's right. just one issue. But the point is, is that, like I said, it comes down to whoever is going to be a better mouthpiece or a better um uh, what, what's the word that i'm looking for a better catalyst um yeah that, that's well, what I'm trying I, to say. I mean honestly i'm i'm still on the fence because if you want to create the maximum amount of chaos i i th i think they're probably still deciding it you know because they've they've created both the chaos on both sides trump wins you're going to have protests that are going to create massive amounts of damage and you're going to have to instill martial law in some cities you will there's there's no way around it I mean, you should have done it now in some cases. Um, but if, again, if Biden wins, then you create economic, a huge economic chaos. So what's, what's more disruptive? I'm not sure. I, I really am not sure. I mean, you'd have a lot more layoffs with the Biden thing, but the Biden thing would, would sort of calm down. It would be lesser. I mean, there'd still be a whole bunch of protests, but they wouldn't be angry protests. They'd be, um, they'd be empowered protests, which is, anyway. Well, all of this just seems so obvious. It seems so clear. But why are there so many people in the truth community that want to believe that Trump is some kind of unsung hero and that there's some kind of plan? What is going on with QAnon it, it, and all of these people in the truth community that actually believe in the system? I don't. Well, get it. The, the Trump Messiah story, that was early in the year, but that has lost some steam. I'm after. still seeing it, though. I'm still yeah, seeing it on Instagram, out, a lot of people there, that I follow. It's not, here, here's the thing. People, I think, realize it's that started with the whole draining the swamp type deal where we're, oh, we're going to go after Pete's Gate. We're going to go after all the pedophiles. And, you know, yeah, sure, Epstein got caught and he, got, he died. But Maxwell, do we have any, have we heard from her recently? I, I, I haven't know, unless, heard anything recently. Yeah, exactly. Unless they're hiding her, you know, because of the Democrats, that'd be a lovely thing if you wanted to. I mean, if you want to discredit Trump in the last minute. You have her come out, whether it's true or not, and say, oh, yeah, he was absolutely at the island. All sorts of, you know, all sorts of things. But the problem with the whole Pizzagate Trump draining the swamp is people don't understand the, the hierarchy of power. That is, the president of the United States is not that high up on the food chain. He just isn't. He's a, he's a figurehead. He's like a press secretary. But for the, for the whole country, he doesn't have authority over other nations' rulers. You know what I mean? So yeah. he, it, Trump, Trump would have a hard time, other than ordering a full-blown military strike, good luck with that, of doing anything to the royal family of England or Ireland or Scotland or any of the families of Europe or really anybody. So people say, oh, yeah, he's going to get all the pedophiles in the world. I mean, whoever created that story, genius, who, whoever concocted that, because it did work. Because people say, oh, Trump's for us. And he's going he's gonna to fight evil and blah, blah, blah. It's like, really? Really? Do you understand? <laughs> Who, who he is i mean watch some documentaries on the guy he's he's you know he's he was just a rich kid that uh you know basically sold his name for everything he used the trump to endorse literally every, he, if he could put his his name on every napkin in the country he won and he no he's i've told you look he's not going to save anybody you know what does he does he talk a good game you know does he represent well does he get the the right all fired up yeah he does yeah great but he still, you know, remember, yeah, like you said, he was still selected. <laughs> he wasn't, um, you know, it was, come on. Like you said, it, it didn't even make sense. He, he's not even a politician. <laughs> we, right. We elected a reality television star 
for the president of the United States. It's like, well, I mean, it's almost not the first time. Look at Ronald Reagan. He was a, I mean, he, yeah, he, he did yes, serve he in the was. military, but he also uh, was an actor. Jesse, Jesse Ventura was the governor of Minnesota. Arnold Schwarzenegger. There you go. Was the governor of California. And come on, they actually tried this some years ago. The problem was, is that um, Arnold was born in Austria. So, and they, they wanted to change the rules so he could run for president, but he just didn't have enough momentum to pull it off. If he would have done it back in the nineties. Yeah. He actually could have, he actually could have done it because we're, we're, we learned a long time ago through the think tanks that when it comes to politicians or leaders, they have to be TV or media friendly. It used to be just TV or movies, but now it's media friendly, which is why you have like Obama. Perfect example. Oh my God, he was brilliant. Um, the uh, do, you, do you remember the the new Superman movies like Man of Steel and stuff like that? Sure. Okay, yeah. you remember the Black General? Uh, in, it's it's uh, been too long. I couldn't tell. Oh, it's been too all right. long. Yeah. Okay, well, the Black General from the, the new Superman movies, he was on a radio show and uh, he was just doing some off-the-cuff stuff. Didn't realize like, uh, dude, you know, everything goes somewhere. And he was telling people, it's like, oh boy, he's Obama. He's going, he goes, Obama is modeled after me. I coached him. You know, Obama took acting, you know, act, acting lessons through this guy, through this black actor. That's amazing. And he goes, when you're watching Obama, you're basically watching a version of me. And boy, did, uh, did he backpedal on that fast? Because as you can imagine, you know, there were people that, were, that wanted to talk to him, especially conspiracy people. They were tied in the media and he, he won't talk about it anymore. He will not. He will not. Bring that it is. Up. That's so freaking crazy. I'm gonna have to look into that. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look it up if you get a chance. And again, Obama, great on camera. Probably the best president we've had on camera to date. Uh, you know, he, even John F. Kennedy wasn't that good. I mean, John F. Kennedy was all about the illusion. You know, Camelot and his wife and the whole Kennedy family thing. But uh, Obama was hand tailored, and they had a problem there too. The whole birthing thing. Because people say, oh, you know, Obama wasn't, you know, he was born here. It's like, well, no, but they, they buried it pretty. And you got to remember, remember who the champion was? Remember who the guy was that really was leading the charge against that? Do you remember who that was? Uh, it was Donald Trump. Okay, yeah. Donald Trump was the guy. He, that's how Donald, because Donald was still doing the, the, the TV thing. And, and, he was, and he was calling him out. And the Photoshop evidence looked like it's like, yeah, looks like he was born in Kenya. Now, granted, it's a ticky tack thing. Does anyone really care? No. But, you know, if you're following the letter of the law, it does look bad. Sure. And, and so they just kind of snuck him in there. And anyway. Well, and, and just really quick back to the, the truth community thing, just, uh, just to get your perspective on this, it's interesting to me that a lot of people also have this very Amerocentric perspective. And in that they, a lot of people think that when the election happens, if Biden wins, that everything COVID nineteen is going to just go away, that it's just going to fade uh, away because there won't be a way to demonize Trump anymore. But I'm like, how can you have that perspective when this is happening worldwide? Exactly, exactly. And and that particular argument also got a lot of steam in the beginning, which was, oh, you know, the Democrats are just using this to take down Trump. It's like you don't shut down 160 countries just to take down Trump. Why in the world would you shut down India? To take down Trump. It makes no sense. It, there, is, there is no connection there. However, there's an old saying that is if America sneezes, the world catches a cold. Something to that effect. Whatever happens in America, you know, that's coming up in November will affect, you know, the rest of the world. We are integrated with, with just about everything. Um, but no, no, of course it's not a democratic plot. And no, if Biden's elected, no, the virus won't go away. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, it, it, if anything... You know, he'll just, you know, there will be no fighting it. He will just literally do whatever is said. You know, if you, if you believe it's going to go that way, he'll, he'll, he'll do whatever they want him to until he dies, which could be any day. And uh, he could be the only president to die of natural causes in the office. I'm not going to count um, FDR from the, uh, from World War II because he was in three terms and he had polio and all this other stuff. Uh, and everybody knew it. So, but would Camilla Harris, you know, what would she do? It was like, oh, wow. You know, you know, she didn't even do well in the debates. She was carrying single digits. And now she's one heartbeat away, you know, at that point from, from being president. Yeah, it's, it's a weird world. I mean, again, I told people last year, I said 2020 feels like it's going to be epic in its strangeness. And part of it was the simple reason because of just the number, 2020. 
which is oh, yeah. the year 2020 vision, vision. 20, yeah. 2020 hindsight, 2020 clarity, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it, people, I, I, I keep harping on this and you, I think you kind of get it, which is look, the average person, the people, most of the people that are walking around there uh, right now are just lemmings. They just are, you know, I call them NPCs. I don't think for most part, they're, they're just soulless drones that are walking around that, that just fill up space. And you, whatever plan you roll out as an Illuminati member, let's just say Illuminati or the powers of big, um, it's got to be very, very simple to understand. Because if it's too complex, you know, it, it, you, whatever message you're going to pump out to the, the crowd, it's got to be, if it's too complex, they're you're just going to go over their heads. They're going to lose It's got to be media friendly. Very media friendly. And it's got to be simple. You know, it's got to be COVID-19. something you can hashtag. Yes. There you But you know what? I'm going to steal that. It has <laughs> to be hashtagable. If it's not hashtagable, you might as well not even, might not even use it. It's got to be, a, be a, something you can abbreviate down, shrink down to where people can use it in water cooler conversations very, very easily. So. Well, we've talked a lot about um, 2020, but I think 2021 is going to be just as strange. We've seen a lot of pre-programming for a second wave. Mark, do you think there's going to be a second wave or are they just going to drag this initial wave out as long as they can? How, what is this going to look like? Uh, 2021 i know i'm gonna go another direction unfortunately i'm i'm going to do a little fear here uh because sooner or later you know if you're going to try to control the population sooner or later you're going to have to pull the trigger and because the, remember the, the big goal i'm not talking just georgia guidestones but all sorts of different groups the there's too many people too many and yeah, fine. You got a virus out there and yeah, lots of people think, you know, they're, they're over exaggerating the numbers and there's lots of people that think that more people are dying than actually are. Uh, but eventually how are you going to do a, a population reduction? I still believe I've said this since the beginning of the year. I still believe in what I call the event. I still believe there is something coming, something big, and it is going to change everything. It's going to be very, very, very quick. And and I don't know. I don't even really know how to describe it because it might okay. be for sure. So so really quick, yeah. just uh, just to get your your thoughts on this while we're talking about it. A thought that popped into my head recently is: is there a difference between a new world order being put into place yeah. and the new world order being put into place? Because a lot of people have talked about how this could, and I have myself too. This could just be a trial run for something that's going to happen. Maybe not even in my lifetime, right? What do you think? Oh no, no, no! I think it's way, way quicker than this. This is there's no trial run here. They do you think the this is it? This is this, the this is, new world order. order. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it. This is the reset. Um, and the reason I say that is because of the cry wolf scenario, which is you can't roll out something like this virus and have it be unless unless again you thought it was you know this would be a dry run but maybe the contingency was if everybody took it seriously and everybody bought it which they did then you go forward meaning you 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 take this all the way because you can't if you roll out the virus now or you keep this virus going and then you roll out a new or you pull it back let's let's just go to the hypothetical let's say Biden wins and all of a sudden you just shut it off right because the media can do that i've seen those different stories where they just stop talking about it and people are like, um, what? <laughs> so if you do that, you can't bring it back again because of all the economic damage in its wake. Meaning the virus was one thing, but over the course of eight months, we're on you know, September now, month nine, we, there's so much pain and suffering has been created, especially economically, that no one's going to want to listen to you the second time around because they're going to say, yeah, we don't care anymore. Because, because, look, I've lost my job, lost my house, lost this, lost that. There's a lot of very, very unhappy people. There's a whole new wave of homeless that's happening. There's a whole, you know, there's, I, keep, I mean, I did a rant recently. You have, people don't have any idea the amount of corporations that are brand name corporations that are gone now. And small shops, you know, in main streets, they're boarded up for good. You know, restaurants aren't coming back. People aren't going to the movie theaters. Uh, flights, but that was another thing, by the way, they never did close the airports, but airlines, if it wasn't for the money that the, um, uh, the government paid the airlines, all the airlines would be gone. The only reason the airports are even running right now is because they're, they're paying massive unemployment benefits to these guys. Plus, you know, the, the airlines are actually part of the military, you know, in case of a crisis, people don't know that Right. we use them for transports. So uh, what I'm getting at is, is that 
the, all this is going to be moving forward into one, you know, will we make it to a vaccine stage? Yeah, possibly. Um, but I still believe you have to get a part where, where you've got to jolt the system, something really, really hard where it's, you, and I've said this for a while now, which is the reason why Americans are, you know, breaking out of quarantine and doing their own parties is because Americans is like, look, you, you got to scare them enough. It, it's my, and I, finally I ran into somebody interviewed me recently. The, the why I try to tell people is like, look, look at the contact list on your phone. However many it is, 50 people, a hundred people, whatever it is. Do you have anyone on your contact list that died from this? I have ran into now one person <laughs> and he's from Europe. Well, the, then we, the, we can't even confirm if it is actually a COVID oh, death. Exactly, exactly. But, but the point is, is that if, it, if the death rate is one in a hundred, here's the difference. You ha- in order to scare people, it's got to be personal. The reason why people are walking around without masks is because you haven't scared them enough. Meaning um, if it's one in a hundred people, you know dead people. Meaning the guy at the gas station, uh, the person who does your nails, <laughs> the, the, the guy that bags your groceries, blah, blah. blah. You, you, people are going to be, would be dying, a lot of them. You wouldn't, well, the, well, yeah, well, Mark, I, I've said it almost every episode yeah. that the reason that's why some people that have died of a random like like a motorcycle accident or a heart attack or yeah. diabetes or whatever. That's why some of those deaths have been attributed to covid because they need people to have yeah. an emotional yeah, yeah, yeah. connection, but even, emotional investment. But even that isn't enough. And I, I did this in a rant where where's the here's the difference. The difference between this and any other if it was a real pandemic is there's no shock and awe. Meaning in a real pandemic, and I highly recommend everyone watch the um, Steven Soderbergh movie, uh, Contagion, is that in that pandemic, people drop like flies, healthy people. People are walking, people are walking, and two weeks later, they are dead. <laughs> you know, they are, they're, they're healthy people, you know, didn't matter what your age group was, your 20-year-old dead, 30-year-old dead. 80-year-old people, no offense, but they're already past life expectancy. And they've already, uh, most of them have underlying conditions. So that's the difference. It's a, there, so it wasn't a big surprise. Again, the line from the Joker: when a when a um, you know load of gangbangers or a, 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 a truck full of troops dies, it's fine because it's all part of the plan, you know. But if one little you know school gets blown up, people lose their minds, right? right. And that's because it's it's a shock, and there's no shock and awe. There's no fear. That's what's missing here, and that's what I'm waiting for. That's well, what it's like. I, just to offer my perspective really quick. Is yeah. I think that the fact that there is no shock and awe is one of the problems because they're going to – like the numbers that we talked about earlier, how the CDC just quietly updated the numbers, that only 6% of the death count could actually be attributed to COVID-19. Right. Well, they're going to champion that number, and they're going to say that it's because of the measures that we took, these totalitarian authoritarian yeah, they, measures, because of they, these measures that we took. But, that's what, that's that, why so few people died. But that's the problem is that there's no control group. You can't yeah, make a scientific claim like that if we don't have a control group. Well, actually, there is, though. I mean, like Sweden, for example, which the American media was just harping on. Saying, but oh, some no, people Sweden. In, in Sweden were wearing masks, though, but it was by choice. A lot of people were Right, actually. right, right. They just weren't but, forced but to I mean, like there's that. some states, the viruses, I, I can't stress this enough, viruses don't work like this. They spread extremely fast and they go everywhere. It's, you know, it, it, it's, you know, touch to touch to touch to touch, you know, surface contact and you're breathing in people. And the big thing, and I can't, I, I'm going to drive this into people's heads if it kills me, which is the, air, the airplanes and the airports. If, if, if this was an actual pandemic, you shut the airports down. You just don't close the borders. You shut the airports down because you don't want people flying from state to state because the airports are, the airplanes are literally incubators. Yeah, I that's the talked, best way to spread something, to yeah, spread some the, kind I have, of disease. I have talked to pilots. Look at the end of 12 monkeys, for God's sakes. <laughs> the, uh, the pilots have told me the same thing. It's like, look, the filters don't do anything. If they're making this, he goes, within 10 seconds of them making coffee in the back of the airplane, we smell it in the cockpit. And he goes, and that's something I try to stress to people that are wearing masks. I was going, can you smell something when you're wearing that mask? You go, yeah. Then you're, the mask isn't doing anything. Right. Literally nothing because, you know, like smoking, you, like you're walking next to a smoker. Do you smell the smoke? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Those particles are actually bigger than supposed, the supposed virus particles. So why are you wearing the mask? Uh, well, because uh, whatever. Well, yeah. it, that's one of the greatest inconsistencies in all of this, but there's another inconsistency. That's almost comical, which was 
that allegedly it was people over the age of like 45 and 50 that were more at risk of dying from COVID initially. So right. what did the first thing that the universities did is send all of the students back home to their fa- to their parents right. who are probably above the, that age, 45 right. and 50, probably in that age bracket. That makes absolutely zero sense. Nope. And you, of course sent, the- you sent all of these potential carriers – yeah. you know, based on the fake science, back to the people who are at risk. Yeah, it, it is the, the misdirection, the confusion, the chaos that they have caused with this. No, so let me circle back. Um, and eventually I've, I've got to run out of here. But what everything that's moving, no, they're not pulling back from this. This is not a drill. Let me, let me say that again. This is not a drill. They're, they can't back off of this because they've gone too far. There's too much damage. There's too much economic chaos. Uh, they're they're going forward with this. The question is is what is the next move? You know, what is is it going to be artificial or something coming that they knew was going to come? Sure. You know, something that they predicted. You know, who knows what it is? There's all sorts of theories out there, um, but whatever it is, has got to be extremely extremely disruptive. And the reason why I say it's an event is because the the common thread that has been following all of this is that is stay home, be home, go home. Which is which we've never ever seen before, and that makes sense in the event of a major disaster. Well, let's say it's a meteor or a, or a comet or whatever you want to call it, something or a super volcano. Don't really, it doesn't really matter. The problem they figured out some years ago is that if the family is spread out, as you know, mothers and fathers, they will do anything. We've seen this in movies. Oh God, forever. And that is, if you're separated from your kid during a natural disaster, what do you do? Yeah, you jump in your car. You get in your car and you head out. That's what happened in D.C., by the way, during an earthquake. That was one of the big things that they had to think about was there was an earthquake in D.C. And Which not, it's, not, it's rare for D.C. to have earthquakes, right? Yeah, but what happened was two things happened very, very fast. First off, it was during a school day. Um, all the phone lines jammed up. Why? Because all the parents were calling the schools to see what the hell happened. And then when they couldn't get through because the phone lines were jammed up, they all got on the freeways and they jammed up. And this is instant, you know, that herd thing. And so what, what's happened now, I will, you know, if you want to recover from something, if you want to do a reset, well, to make it as least painful as possible for you, the empire builder, you want your population to be centralized. A family that is home is better for you than a family that is spread out because family spread out. That's just chaos. That's, that's no good. Nothing is ever going to come from that. But a family that's home, you can work with that. Absolutely. You know I mean? Well, and it's easier to control people if they're all home and together. I mean, that's oh, yeah. kind of like the theory behind this whole smart city thing. They want to get people to move from yeah. the rural areas into the smart cities because, or in, at least into the bigger metropolitan metropolitan areas, because it's easier to control people. Right. They're more compact like that. So, yep. yeah, I mean, theoretically, it makes perfect sense. Well, Mark, I want to ask you one yes. last question. I want to get your perspective on one last thing sure. before before I let you go. And yep. that is, uh, you are one of the few people in the truth community that has been vocal about about believing that the government has no way of being able to take guns away from us because of the oh yeah I did you that know the grasp that Smith and Wesson and all these different guns yeah yeah the gun have. grab yeah 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 the the so problem the has problem your opinion that, changed is what I'm getting at with has been, no going no on. it has not no in fact I in, in this is funny you'd mention that because in my next rant coming up on Tuesday I talk about that I said you know what there's be a, a small thing that'll happen if Biden wins and that will be an immediate gun buyout from you know any any Republican that that was on the fence about buying guns they're going to be buying guns they're going to max out their credit cards and buy sure. guns. sure however we've seen this people forget and, and I'm not saying it's a marketing ploy people just let it happen and that is the firearms lobby in the United States is massive it is massive it is military backed and there are a lot of private companies look we've been selling military weapons to the to the um the public since basically the 80s um start out with dirty harry and and we in hollywood glamorize it. i mean the whole action hero thing what do you think action heroes are doing they're shooting guns and the gun, gun companies figure out they could make guns for these movies and then sell the civilian versions to the civilians and so there's, there's huge companies out there. They're very, very old. You know, Remington and Smith and & Wesson and, and Colt and Ruger and oh, it just goes on and on and on and on. Uh, and these companies have a massive, massive lobby. So even if Biden came in and started, said, oh, we're going to do a gun grab, it's like, how are you going to do it? How exactly are you going to do it? There is no physical way to do it. Here's why. It's, it's kind of like 
why when people say, oh, you know, there could be martial law nationwide. It's like, you don't understand. There's only like 2 million servicemen nationwide in, in all branches of the armed forces right now. We're mostly a tech-based military. We don't have droves and droves and droves of infantry that you can send to everywhere. Even if you want to create martial law in this country, you, you can only do a handful of cities, maybe a state or two, but for way too big. We've got huge, huge tracts of land with small towns everywhere. What are you going to do? You can't control them all. You can set up checkpoints here and there, but you, there's no way you can enforce martial law. Same thing with the gun grab, which is people, people forget their memories are so short term. It's like Obama said he was going to do the whole gun rights thing. And he was in eight years. Nothing budged when it came to gun guns. Um, he also said, by the way, he was going to get rid of um, Guantan Guantanamo, Gitmo. I can understand why they call it Gitmo. Um, <laughs> and he was like, well, I'm going to shut that down. He said that so many times. Nope, never even, never even considered it. Never even considered it. So Biden comes on. Oh, yeah, he might talk a good game. You, wh you can do a gun buyback. That's about the best you can do is do a gun buyback. Where you go out to the cities like, oh, you know, because people are short on cash. In fact, if you want to do, that's probably your best move. Now, now that I think about it, people are so short on cash. It's like, we're going to offer, you're just printing money anyway. We're going to offer $1,000 a gun. Drag, drag or whatever gun you got in, we'll, we'll give you 1000 bucks for it. There would be a lot of people that would give up their guns. Some of them. Anyway, but they'd still keep the good stuff. Sure. And, well, and, and, I, and I happen to agree with you. I just wanted to get your perspective on that because I'm of the belief that, yeah, there's police officers out there and there are um, guys in the military out there who would have a chip on their shoulder and I could see them. And they do abuse their power every now and sure. then. However, the majority of police officers and the majority of the armed forces are people like you and me, really. I mean, they're just everyday Americans who wouldn't want to exercise martial law on their fellow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why would you? And again, martial law is, is a nice idea, but until you're running to people that you went to school with. Or you're, exactly. You're, well, that's why I think martial law would, would be one of the dumbest things that the government, that's this whole virus thing works way better. Well, again, yeah, the, the virus thing, yeah, because you're self-quarantining everybody. Yeah, the virus has worked very, very well. Martial law works in, well in cities. That's where it works well. The suburbs, there's, there's just too much land. People don't understand it. It's, the America's a big place. If those of you who haven't driven around, it's very, very big, especially when you get to the West. There's just huge, huge sweat. You wonder why the West states are so big? It's because they didn't want to take the time to divide them up. It's like, let's just make these huge states in the West. Um, that and, sorry, one more thing when it comes to the gun grab, and that is logistically, here's the social media screws up the whole thing, which is when you start a gun grab, you once you start rolling it out, people start talking to each other. Where do you roll it out first? Do you want to go to cities? Do you want to go suburbs? You don't have enough personnel to go everywhere. And you have neighbors like, dude, you know, you know, such and such just, just took out Cletus's gun stash, bury, bury your stuff. People just hide everything. There's so many places <laughs> to hide and they're not going to look for them. They're going to come. It's like, hey, you know, they're just going to lie. People say, hey, we see you have three registered firearms. And they say, nope, sold them years ago. Private party. See ya. You know, and it's like, oh, we'll search warrant. They will get tired of searching houses and not finding anything. And then, sorry, the gun grab is not going to happen. Not, not, not going to happen. It's, um, they, they won't, there won't even be armed skirmishes about it. It'll just be that people will just lie and say, nope, don't have any. I mean, that, seriously, how hard would it be to hide stuff from, from a search party that you knew was coming? That's yeah. the difference. If you, yeah, if it sprung on you, oh yeah, yeah, they might get some stuff, sure. But if they knew, if you knew days in advance or even, even just hours in advance, you would stop. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's, it definitely seems like more of a uh, a right wing kind of conspiracy tinfoil hat yep. wet dream, really. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's just it is something it that is. has been and cooked up it, by people, and it's used to bolster sales. I mean, here, hell, this year with the gun stuff has gone through the freaking roof, and you will see that if Biden wins, the gun stores will empty out, just absolutely freaking empty out. Because remember, the one thing. Let me end on this: that people forget. And it's no, matter, no matter what happens November 3rd, people forget the president still gets to stay for another two months. People forget that. Inauguration isn't until January. You have two months of Trump not going anywhere. And like the mob that's going to be out there in Washington, they're going to be, they'll, they'll demand him like resign. You don't get to stay two months. You don't get to stay two days. You have to leave now. And, and the riots will even continue from there. So, yeah, for the two months after that, yeah, there'll, there'll be people buying tons and tons of guns. And they'll probably regret it later. Or maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Mark, hey, uh, 
man, you just don't even know. This has been such a fascinating, amazing conversation. I got to sit down with one of my heroes. I mean, this Aww. is this has just been so cool. So thank you cool. so much for coming on the show. And um, I really appreciate it, man. You gave so so much meat for this podcast episode. So I right really appreciate on. it. All right. Well, hey, thank you again to everyone. Anyone's listening. You know, do your own research, ask questions, and uh, you know, brace well, and, and and Mark, plug all your stuff real quick. Uh, I forgot oh, to yeah, ask you to do, do that. You know, just type in if you're going to find my stuff. Go out to um, uh, YouTube and type in Flat Earth Mark. You'll find me. My my channel is just my name, Mark Sargent. Uh, I've got three books on Amazon. You can find me there. Just type my name in there. Uh, thing on Netflix called Behind the Curve, a movie you may have seen if you've been quarantining yourself and uh commercial and i do a podcast on on truth or Country radio and all sorts of other fun stuff you'll you'll find me but but don't look at just my stuff look at if you want to look at some stuff um there's a playlist on my channel called flat earth shortlist for new people and it i, I don't even know if i've even got a video in there Every, it's just all the other creators there's just great people out there that are doing stuff and there's a conference i'm going to be doing in october uh it's the only personal appearance i think i'm even doing this year um you know after the virus hit uh, in um, South Carolina, it's Flattoberfest, the the only Flatter conference that's going to be happening uh, October twenty fourth. Awesome, yeah. perfect. Well, uh, again, thanks again, and man, just yeah. have a good night, and hopefully we will be able to reconnect again in the future. All right, man, you have a good one. Hey, you too, Mario. We'll talk to you later. Before I wrap up this episode, I got a new five star review that I just have to read. It's from your friendly neighborhood, Alex. Alex Soli316, my boy, my best friend. He said, highly recommended. You can really tell that Tanner cares about these topics and puts his full heart into it. Also, his soothing, sexy voice is really nice after a long, stressful day in this crazy world we live in. <laughs> well, thanks, my guy. And I don't know if I can agree that my voice is sexy. I think it's a little bit nasally, but oh well, as long as it uh, does it for somebody, that's all that matters. So thanks, man. All right, listeners, if you made it this far, thank you so much for sticking with me. If you liked what you heard, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and follow me on Instagram at 1980nowpodcast. That's 1980 underscore podcast. And if you really, really like the podcast, you can support me by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and maybe I'll read it on the show. As usual, Another really cool episode will be dropping a week from now, so be sure to stay tuned. Alright guys, y'all already know. I'll see you next time. Stay free. <laughs>